This is the Authentic Dating series brought to you by Ahmad and David. Where we explore what it takes to have a dating life you're excited about. Hi guys, I'm David. I'm Ahmad. And this is the Authentic Dating series. So on this podcast, we're all about empowering men to take control of their dating by teaching a complete understanding of how to create meaningful and passionate relationships that men desire. And we're known for leaving men feeling confident in who they are and showing up in a, in a way that's naturally attractive. Mm, passion. Passion jumped out me there, you know? Mm. Like especially with this episode, I think living life with passion, not just relation to be passionate, but actually you be passionate for your life is just so important, you know? Mm. And it's a very, very attractive trait to have as a man, a woman, or a dog, or whatever, right? People are attracted to people that have passion. Did you just say dog? I just say dog. People like dogs, right? Dogs have passion. (laughs) Have you ever seen a dog run after a bone? (laughs) They look passionate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can't have passion without feelings and emotions. So, So it's really important. Great. So I just want to thank all you listeners for like listening, for sharing, for posting on Instagram, for talking to us on Instagram. It's like, it's really beautiful to hear what you think and what you love about the episodes and also hearing about what else you want us to record about. Um, It's something that people have been coming to us with, which is is, is beautiful and feel free to get in contact with us and let us know. Um, We're also running a really amazing challenge on Instagram at the moment, which has been going for a little while, called 30 Days of Feeling, um, oh, sorry, 30 Days of Men Feeling, where- Hashtag. (laughs) Where we are posting every day uh, how we're feeling, every morning or afternoon or evening, whatever time suits us. And like various men that we know have been doing the same. And it's just been so, I feel it's been really cathartic to like talk about how I feel every day. And I generally are talking about it, but to talk about it in a kind of structured way, like every morning wake up and do that has been amazing. And some of the sharing from other guys has been, has been really moving. And it's what I feel I'm seeing with some of the guys is enabling them to just be more expressive in who they are. And also uh, we've noticed that the women who follow us are really, they really love it. Women really want you to express how you feel. Mm, yeah it's been really well received and especially from both men and women actually mm. i was gonna say i was gonna say especially from women but actually both men and women just saying thank you for for opening up and and sharing in this way so everyone can understand so yeah it's really cool get involved you can still get involved yeah and um it's just great you know even if you don't want to uh, overtly share you can send us a message and we can post anonymously or not post at all it's fine yeah, too. yeah we've been posting anonymously for a few people or however you want to get involved just just do it even if it means you just writing a note in your phone about how you're feeling that day it just it just wonders to know, start to learn more about your feelings and the ability to then express those mm-hmm. we also have some really amazing events um that are coming up so we've got another event called deeper dating which we'll be running with uh also bar from taylor matched so the whole principle there is that speed dating generally is kind of boring and shitty right it's all small talk talking about what you do for a living your job blah 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 Right. So we've come up with some techniques and some some really interesting questions to allow you to actually get to know someone in those few minutes you get to speak. We can do some exercises to kind of get you in the mood for the evening, do a talk about, you know, the key to creating connections and deep and meaningful ones. And then we're going to sit you down with each other and you're going to have fun. You're going to get to know each other and you're going to feel some actual chemistry. Mm, Nice. And then we've got another event coming up which again is great with some old friends of ours, the guys from Single Boss. They run a kind of dating event for kind of entrepreneurs and professionals. So we're going to be down there running a like mini workshop beforehand about how to get in the mood for for an event like that. You know, get your kind of social juices, your, your vocals going beforehand so you're not feeling shy and awkward. And then we're going to do a, a talk about how to completely take charge of your dating life and feel like you are the driver when it comes to your dating life and you're not just having, you know, being hit by the winds of the the world it's like if you are the driver you're taking control yeah and if you want to find any more information about those events you can find out on our website which is www.authenticdatingseries.com or best place i think to ever interact with us is on our instagram which is at authentic dating series and we're you know we're posting everything that we do there awesome so i think that's that's it so we can be getting to the episode now that we're doing with Tess Ilias, which is all about how he kind of quit his boring and mundane job to really follow his passion, which was to be a comedian. And mm. we've been friends with Tess for how long now? I've probably mm. about eight years, nine years. Mm, yeah, something like that. Yeah, and when we met him, he was just a humble civil servant. Actually, he goes into this, but mm. and now he is, you know, a world famous comedian. If you know, he's what played at Live at the Apollo. Yeah. At O2. Yeah. 
Like this is no small feat for a, for a comedian. He's on multiple TV programs. Yeah, and he's a very humble man. He doesn't talk about this on the episode. No. He's got a podcast called uh, Test Talks mm. with the BBC. Mm, yeah, like you can't really be more in fucking doing well than that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's doing really well, and um, we're really excited to have him on the show because what we really believe is uh, is lifestyle. You know, is how that's really important to to your dating, to your confidence as a man. And also to your experience of life, the quality of the life that you live. And one of the big things that we wanted to discuss with Tez was about, you know, what is it like to take the leap and go for something that you're passionate about doing? Because we know so many of us just kind of bide our time and wait for it till tomorrow so that we could do something that we would love to do. And Tez wasn't one of those guys. He jumped in. Yes, it was different. Yes, he took a risk, but, you know, it really paid off. And, and, you know, Tez really opens up and speaks a lot about what that experience was like for him. And also, I think the secondary thing was a lot of people presume that if you're famous uh, and you know, like you're well known, then all of a sudden women are going to be falling at your feet and you're never going to have to worry about women again. And that's, you know, Tess says it's absolutely true. <laughs> <laughs> but... It comes with the caveats, and, mm. and and he talks about that. Like, it's not always cool to be in a restaurant and be noticed, and mm. and how sometimes you just want to be. Mm. He talks about what it's like to date when when you're famous. You know, we've often men come, we talk to, and they go, "Ah, oh, you know, if I have status, then you know, dating would be easy for me." And actually, Tez goes into the truth about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, without further ado, <laughs> let's get in. So we're here with Tez Ilias and uh, some of you have possibly seen him uh, around, uh, possibly on Netflix, Everything. Everything. on radio, BBC, um, Channel 4, Channel 4, ITV, uh, ITV2. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. And the lovely um, villa in Bali. Yes. In- Instagram. Yeah. Instagram. Blackburn. Jeremy Corbyn's Instagram. As well. Oh yeah. Yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Man, he's literally everywhere. He's everywhere. Wow. Yeah, it's probably easy to say where he's not. Let's say doing bits. Yeah. Doing his bits. He's not currently on Mars. Uh, he's not doing any shows on Mars at the moment. No, so I think it's in the pipeline. Yeah, probably. He will be there soon, shortly for the Martians. So we want to ask you, Tez, because our listeners. Wait. Oh, you want to so, jump in? Tez, do you want to introduce yourself? Hello, I am uh, the aforementioned Tez Ilias. Uh, I'm a stand-up comedian, and actor, and uncle. Uncle. Oh wow! Yeah. The newly uncle or no? Seven of them, man. Seven. Yeah. Wow. Seven. Too many. Lots of no? procreation in the family. Yeah. yeah. It was a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a yeah. That's a lot. Yeah, I like like I love them. I don't I don't like any of them, but I, I like I, I love them a lot. Like I would die for two of them, but you know I wow. you know I'd. Um... We won't get you to say which two. No. <laughs> no. So they know though. Was there was there anything else for the intro? No, no. All right, we're going. We're it's going still in. very weird, isn't it? It is. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I was just about to jump straight into the questions. Uh, I'm, all, I'm all flustered. I mean, I've never. It been seemed a lot around. more. It seemed a lot more relaxed before we press I've, record. I've never, I know. I've never been. I've like, never... We, like we know each other. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, but we've never done this naked before. That's so. true. <laughs> and you never knew that one man could be so hairy. <laughs> Is it Tez or Chewbacca? Who knows? Let's talk about Dave, but yeah, yeah, yeah. you're pretty hairy too. So smooth right? on the outside. <laughs> yeah, no, we were pretty chill before. It's the chai. It's got me excited. Uh, mm. yeah, oh, chai before we left. Yeah, oh, it was very nice. Yeah, because I said she said, "What do you want to drink?" And I said, "Oh, a green tea would be nice." She went coffee, and I went, oh, "I don't drink coffee." And then when I occasionally drink chai, she went, "I can make chai." Wow. And then, well, go on then. And then, yeah, she spent like 15 minutes making chai and it is delish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. She's schooled in the arts of being Indian, despite mm. being a Caucasian white girl. Mm. 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 I don't know how I found her, literally. But she's not Anglo-Saxon, know. though. No. Which seems like you just... Bit of a, Brexit, a bit more cultured. Bit of a Brexit situation, isn't it? Yeah. I don't want to go into it. And yeah. Like, oh, she's French. Okay. Yeah, oh God. Yeah. Oh, but does uh, she have an American passport or a French passport? Uh, she's got both. I thought she'd be alright then, isn't it? Yeah, let's do the podcast on that. I think. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is but no, it's relevant because I, I worked for ten years at the Home Office. Yeah. Mm. So there you go, guys. There's your link. Wow. So maybe we'll start there then. <laughs> I think we've already started. No. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, actually. That's so what point. you're so now you're a comedian, Tess, mm. and you're working at the Home Office. Mm. So mm. how the fuck did that happen? Okay, so I went to the Home Office straight out of. Well, not literally straight out of uni, but out of uni, I was applying for graduate jobs. Mm. And I was successful on the civil service graduate program called the Fast Stream, which is a hyper-competitive graduate program. And I somehow managed to get on it. Mm. And 
they, they in their infinite wisdoms put me in the home office and I did a 10 stretch. Um, at, at, the, at the home office, working in various different areas, mainly policy, but working on asylum policy, managing a case working team in Liverpool, wow. uh, working on the Olympics, which we literally around the corner from yeah. Victoria Park, uh, working on the Olympics for three years, um, counterterrorism for a year. Wow. Uh, which, and I have to say, yeah. I've never been more radicalized in my life than when I spent a year working on counterterrorism. <laughs> what do you mean? Like, because you see. The area, the bit that I worked on, what they did was they looked at stuff that potentially people who are Muslims might get angry about. Mm. And particularly people who wanted to groom Muslims to do bad things might motivate them to, to look at. And so ordinarily in your day-to-day life, you might look at one or two negative stories a week. But they'd be looking at four or five a day. Wow. Negative stories about Muslims, people harming Muslims or laws around the world going against oh. Muslims. I mean, you see that four or five times a day right. for a year. Yeah. Changes you. Right. Yeah, you must yeah. have had some of them Christians turn Muslim. Huh? In the office. No, they would be, yeah. <laughs> I think they were, no, they were more sympathetic though to like, the Muslim plight. I wouldn't want to say the, the yeah, the plight, not the, not the cause of terrorism, but yeah. the kind of, the, the kind of, because under, underneath all of that stuff, there is a genuine, there is grievance. Yeah. yeah that yeah. is born out of genuine stuff. Yeah. And so when you see that those grievances every single day for a year, mm. when ordinarily you might see one or two a week, yeah. if you're paying attention, mm. yeah, it does something to you. Wow. Wow. Right. So, uh, confession. So, yeah. so, if, so the, the people that need to be checked out for radicalization are those working in the home office. Yeah, yeah. Kind of yeah, yeah definitely. On a regular basis, yeah. Um, and then I worked in, and then I left that very quickly because I didn't enjoy it and worked in modern slavery, human trafficking, stopping it. Uh, for for a for thanks a, for clarifying yeah yeah, yeah, I, yeah I don't know who's listening um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, for uh, for the last couple of years and then that's why I got my big promotion as well to like middle management but six years of those ten years were overlapped with me doing stand up comedy wow so at the point that I could do stand up comedy full time and I could earn a living from it I quit my day job and I also subsequently quit London and moved back up north. Mm. Because you knew me when I was living with Kaz, I'm a mutual friend of ours yeah, uh, in yeah, Clapham yeah. Southride. Um, but I was coming probably towards the end of my uh, sure. civil service journey and the son of career was slowly but surely heading in the direction. Yeah, of yeah. I remember like, I would, I'd go around to visit him and you would like literally wake up, brush your teeth and be out the door, just like a high and by. And then, yeah. yeah, oh yeah, would, yeah, yeah. You'd be on the way somewhere yeah, or yeah, back yeah, from yeah, somewhere. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very busy. So like, yeah, I was getting up in the mornings to go to work. Um... And I just want to stress also, because there might be people listening here who might have worked with me previously, I was shit <laughs> at, being, at being a civil servant. Like, I just wasn't suited to being in a day job. Mm. Um, I have insomnia, so I sleep late, and I always have. Mm. And that means it's hard for me to wake up in the morning, which means it's hard for me to keep at nine to five. Um, and, and then so I started to leave work at like six, seven or something, and then go straight to gigs. So I, I was gigging like three, four times a week. Wow. London, London. Mainly, but sometimes out of London. There's one time I went to Newcastle because I was in the heat of a BBC New Comedy Award competition. And I left work at like three to catch a train to Newcastle, did the heat, got through, and then caught the night bus, the overnight wow. night bus down from Newcastle. Uh, got maybe an hour or two on the night bus and then got into the Victoria Station at 6 a.m. Uh, ran, like, got the tube, got the first tube home back to, I think I was living in Brixton at the time. Just got, did a quick changeover and then went to work. Wow. wow. And that was, that's, that's the hustle. So what comes up for me as you say all of that is like, because it's obviously a massive commitment. Like all of a sudden, it's like, I'm doing this. Mm. I'm re- and it's, yeah, you, there's a point where you quit your day job and you go in full time. But there's actually a point way before then way where you've already then. like, I'm in this for the long haul. So tell us about that. What happened there that you were like, this is definitely something that I want to do. And I'm no longer going to live this ordinary nine to five job that I hate. So... I, I come from a working class, insular, Asian uh, background, living in a northern town where the idea of doing anything out of the norm, yeah. you know, sort of sciences, doctor, engineering, uh, yeah. maybe being a teacher or something, like yeah. anything out of that, you're then either a criminal or uh, probably, <laughs> probably on the dole, or, or you're an entrepreneur yeah. with your own business. Yeah. The idea of working in the arts just wasn't on our radar. Like if you said to me at 16 when I was in school, oh, you know, Tez, you're going to become... 
a stand-up comedian one day, like a professional stand-up. <laughs> you might as well have told me I'd become an astronaut. <laughs> it was so far removed from my experiences. I still, to this day, and I've been in this business only 10 years now, as from Blackburn specifically, I know more people who've been to prison than in the arts. Wow. So it's just, it was just a very, it's a world away from, because a lot of people who grew up in a similar background to me in London, but in London, there seems access to opportunities yeah. and the world just seems a bit bigger. Yeah. Whereas in Blackburn, it was, it was, everything was so small. Mm. So I had no ambition to pursue a career in the arts, let alone being on stage and in front of the camera in the way that I am now. Um, I guess people like, people, I think I only realized I was really funny when I got to uni and I could kind of reinvent myself because mm-hmm. I was a bit of a kind of nerdy kid at school and I was, I wasn't like a popular kid, but I was a kid who was well known and kind of well liked, but not someone that anyone took that seriously. But when I was at uni, you could reinvent, you could just be whoever you want, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think people then started telling me that I was quite funny and stuff and oh, that's cool. And then I got into the day job and I was doing all that stuff. And about four years into the day job, I was in London, a bit bored, thinking I just need a hobby. It's a lonely place. Mm. And I'm not from here. I have no family here. Friends, but it's not like it's not like the sitcom friends where everyone just lives together and, and you see <laughs> your best friends every single day. Like everyone is all over the place. And yeah. I just thought I need, I need an evening hobby. So I was looking for a creative writing course. Uh, so I started Googling that and I just chanced upon a stand-up workshop. And I thought, huh. My friends tell me I'm funny. I'm deluded enough to believe them. And also I thought, well, worst case scenario, I'll meet new people and I make a fool of myself. Yeah. I can live with that. Uh, so I signed up to this thing. It was one day a week for six weeks. And it doesn't make you, it doesn't teach you to be funny, but it teaches you the mechanics mm. of stand up and it gets you, just gets you writing, yeah. which I had no idea how you'd even get started. I thought stand up just came out fully formed and then they started selling out theatres. I had no idea about this <laughs> this subculture that is the open mic circuit and all the levels you have to do to progress to even mm. get anywhere near those levels. Um, so I slowly learned that and then I had my first ever gig in June 2010. Uh, and that was like the graduate um, show of the of, of right. the course. And so everyone on that course invited their friends and family and it's sure, quite a safe gig. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that went very well. People laughed in where I wanted them to laugh. With you. And so, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> kind of with me, not at me, which I thought was quite important. Um, and, and I just thought, oh, I really enjoy that. I want to do it again. And then mm. I found out that there's this subculture, this open mic subculture in London, and there's gigs, there's three, four gigs every day of the week. Mm. And so you start networking, you start making friends, and you start finding out where the gigs are. You start emailing people and going, can I kind of have a little spot here? And you start doing just five to seven minute spots. And they started going well. I started entering new act competitions. There's about 10 different new act competitions across mm. the country. I started entering them. And people were just surprised how well I was doing, given that I'd only been going a couple of months. And I was getting to the finals of things. Wow. Like entering my first competitions and getting all the way to the final. Wow. Out of like 500 people, I was in wow. like the top 10. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I remember the first time I entered, like someone else on the course. No, he was on like the sister course. And he'd been going a little bit longer. And then he had decided to do the course. So he'd maybe been going for a year. And he was like, oh, yeah, you entered that, but you know, you know you're not going to get to the final, but it's a good mm. experience. And I just heard that and I went, oh, we'll yeah, see. Sure. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe maybe you're right. Um, but then I was quite lucky. Like in, in comedy, they say you've got to find your first five as quickly as you can. And mm. I was lucky to get that first five minutes that worked for me quite quickly. And so I was able to use that to do well in the competitions. And then doing well in the competitions kind of validated me doing it. Yeah. And so it quickly developed into a very serious hobby Yeah. where I was going from like, one gig every fortnight to like two, three gigs a week. Wow. And sometimes four gigs a week. Let's like leaving work and going to a gig. And um, this is this is all free, right? Like you're not Yeah. And and I was I remember being about a year in thinking to myself, I'm a guy who doesn't drink. And I'm spending my evenings in pubs and clubs, <laughs> basements, basements, attics, making strangers laugh for no money. What is wrong with me? And I, and I feel that about stand-ups, like we are very much outsiders. Mm. We are people who like observe society and have something to say about it without maybe sometimes feeling really part of it. Because I, with my background, I've, I've got parents who are divorced, which was for a mm. Pakistani kid is very, very rare in yeah. the 80s. Mm. So I always felt like a bit of an outsider there. Uh, I was a kid who loved reading. And not that other people didn't read in Blackburn, but I was like torchlight reading <laughs> up till one in the morning because I couldn't sleep. Mm. and no one else talk, even if people did read they never really talked about it I've got a cousin who loves reading but he's also a kid who took a hammer into schools to have a fight so he so he could never talk about that side of his life he's yeah. only going he to he sounds fight. like an interesting character he's a very interesting uh, character yeah. and he's a great guy and, he's, and, and, and his life is amazing now but he kind of um, like he loves he, he's only going to meet Harry, Harry Potter 
okay. because my, my sister introduced me to it and I went, I don't know, I'm not going to read this. And then I found out he read it and I was like, all right. Mm. If the hammer guy's reading it, then, uh, <laughs> then, uh, then the then, hammer. Yeah, not to be mistaken it's, it's with good. the hammer. <laughs> with, is it, don't touch it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I thought it's good enough for me. So I was all. I always felt like a bit of an outsider, and, and so I was very mm. suited to comedy amongst these other oddballs in society. Mm. Um, and yeah, I just, I just loved it, and I, and I quickly thought, I feel like this is the thing that I've been best at. Like I enjoyed my day job, but I wasn't. I wasn't excelling. I was constantly daydreaming, yeah, yeah. constantly thinking about promotions and stuff without ever doing the work, yeah. mm-hmm. but thinking, oh yeah, in five years I could be at this level and that level without doing the groundwork needed to, to get to those levels. And I think it was a constant frustration for my managers who could see that I was an intelligent guy with a lot of potential, but just wasn't knuckling down and, and doing what was needed, what yeah. needed to be done. And then this was the first time that I felt like I wanted to really work hard at something to get good at. Mm. And with the great thing about stand-up is your feedback is immediate. You yeah. immediately know whether what you're doing is good because mm. the audience will let you know. There's no other type of work where you, not that I can think of, where you, where you get that immediate feedback. Like, you know, if you're an actor reading lines, mm. even if you're doing theatre in front of a live audience, because often they're quite serious pieces, you don't immediately get that feedback whether or not it's gone well until right. the end of the show where you might get saying. standing ovation. Yeah. Whereas, yeah, in stand-up, it's constant. Every 30 seconds, they're letting you know how they feel about your performance. Mm. Um, so that was, that's a real buzz. And once you get hooked to that, it's, there's no coming back from it. So I was prob- probably about six months in, I felt validated enough to be like, this could be, this could be a thing. Mm. So for you, it was like you had your two jobs, at the same, two jobs pretty much. For, pretty for, much, for, yeah. What, four years? Six and a half. For six and a half years. So like it became a like, from a, oh, this would be a nice hobby yeah. to a serious hobby. And to that's, like, this is now a job. That's a lot of graft, you know, to do that. Like, can you... When you were making the switch from, you know, from working at the home office to going full-time comedian, you, when you told, like, family and friends, mm. there must have been some reaction of some type. Like, what sort of reaction did you get? So my people? friends were very supportive. Yeah. Especially the ones who, live, who lived in London and, and were able to come to the gigs and see mm. my career progressing and they see how much it meant to me. And, like, Kaz, for example, the guy I live with, who we, both, yeah. who we all know, he could see how hard I was working and, yeah. and, and the levels that I was progressing in and, 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 and the fruits of my labor. And I was, you know, getting what I, what, 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 I was getting the work off the back of what I was putting in. Um, so yeah, my friends were very, very happy for me. People in Blackburn were a bit more, when I first started doing comedy and I told people in Blackburn, they were very confused. <laughs> <laughs> so confused. They were like, I, even to the point where I was like, are you funny? Because I was like, and then I thought, I thought about that because I was like, you know, it's, it's interesting because I'd kind of maybe hadn't shown that side of me in Blackburn because I never felt like I was never the cool kid. I kind of wanted to like, you know, Blackburn is a sort of place, a kind of working class place where if you raise your, if you raise your head above the parapet, you get slapped down. Mm. So if you're a confident kid who wants to say stuff, you're not yeah. really encouraged to do that yeah. because you're kind of, you know, the kids who do that are the, are the tough kids yeah. who no one's going to mess with. Um or, or their friends are going out with them and doing the things that they're doing, the shenanigans that they're doing that I've not really, I've no interest in. Mm. So me, I really came to life when I went to uni and I could reinvent myself and mm. had friends who kind of had similar interest to me and stuff. So they, yeah, people in Blackburn never really got that side of me. So I was kind of like, in, in the first instance, I was like, yeah, yeah. And then I thought, oh, well, it's not fair because you've probably never seen it. Yeah. Or you've, you've seen glimpses of it, but not to the extent that you think, mm, this guy could have a career in this. But also stand-up comedy is such a different thing to like being funny with your mates anyway. Mm. Yeah. Um, like Chris Rock, for example, you know, someone that we all know, um, he is a real introvert. Mm. And, 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 and someone said to him once, when, you know, probably when he was doing one of these types of interviews, and someone said, you know, how are you so funny? And he said, I stay quiet in large groups of people. So he just observes, he just soaks in, you know, people say the funniest things. Yeah. Mm. So he'll either like repurpose something that someone said, or he yeah. just take an anecdote and maybe make it his own. Or just someone will say something and it'll lead him off onto a memory that he's had and stuff. But yeah, yeah it's just... Because real life folks will say the maddest things. Yeah. You know, when you're in a barbershop or, or, <laughs> or, or even a takeaway or just amongst your friends or, you know, your uncles or whatever. They say the maddest things. And, and yeah, it's about, it's about being able to take those things and then, and then rework them and reimagine them into something else and present it to people. Mm. So, um, yeah, so it was... I, I, I get, f- family was the toughest one. Mm. My parents were divorced. So my, my dad has been here since he was six years old. So he's very British. 
Mm. Um, and it's very much like us. He was a bit of a chiller when he was younger and stuff. And he was over the moon. Like, oh. Because oh. oh, he, cool. he was a bit of a black sheep in the family growing up. And okay. so he was like... Another one. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Uh, Go apples, on, my Apples have fallen far from the tree. Yeah. Um, and so he was really pleased and he's been a real supporter. Uh, awesome. whenever, whenever, he can come to, whenever I got a big gig or something, like, like he'd, come and, he'd come and watch and stuff. Mum was the one that really needed winning over. All right. Because when I'm doing well on the circuit and I'm saying, Mum, I've got, I've got a tent spot at the comedy store. Uh-huh. That means nothing. Mm. They have no frame of reference for that yeah. Yeah. whatsoever. But when the radio work started coming in and then a bit of TV work and really Man Like Mobin was probably mm. the big turn, is when other people started saying, you know, what your son's doing is really, mm. it's really important stuff and it's really good what he's doing, the way he's representing us. Mm. And then mum's like, oh yeah, yeah, I mean, of course, very proud of him. And it's like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> always, <laughs> were, you, were you always, mum? <laughs> um, I remember there was one conversation we had when, uh, where she was kind of like, well, you know, but, you know, you might not be doing this in... I think it's when I just on the verge of leaving my job and she's like, well, you know, that's cool, but you might not be doing this in two years time. And I got really defensive and hurt. Mm. And I think she realized then at that moment that actually mm. support him because this mm. is it. This is what he wants to do. Um, and yeah, since then, since the TV stuff has really taken off, she's been really like supportive and very proud of things. Mm. And she tells, and she's, and then she does that annoying thing when she brings you up and you don't want it to bring you up. Like you'll be in the hospital, oh, like, okay. visiting, like someone's had a baby and you're the hospital visiting and then she'll just tell the nurse and you're like, well, Casual. why are you bringing yeah. it up? And you, why are you bringing it up? Yeah. Like, because cause it's, when someone doesn't recognize you and, and then they're like, oh, should I know you? And you're like, well, I don't know. <laughs> My favorite interaction yeah. is when you meet when you meet like two people or more than two people. Yeah. One of them knows who you are, and they're almost like a fan. Yeah. The other person has no idea, and they're like it's, it's, it's him. And the other person's like, I have no idea. And then they look at you like, well, tell him. Yeah. Like, what? You just want me to list my CV? Like, I, I don't know. He doesn't know who I am. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You tell him when I've left this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> That is funny. Yeah. To tell him what you've been in. It's like I'm not going to stand here and list my CV. Like it's it's a stupid thing to do. But I, I think what's beautiful there though is that what's obvious to me coming from an Asian background. I think David, you'd experience the same. Is actually when your mum is doing that, she's actually showing that how proud. I know. Like, I know. Everyone must yeah, know now. Yeah, yeah. yeah everyone yeah, yeah, must yeah, know. Yeah, 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 so that's yeah, beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And there's a bit of over, overcompensation as well. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, they've come. They've come around now, but it wasn't. You know, it's not a career that they would have wanted for me. Um, yeah. Growing up, I don't think any parent wants their no. kid to be a comedian <laughs> no, <laughs> no. But, even an act, but even an yeah. actor or anything like that yeah, but yeah. um you know so, so i take that without yeah. wanting to be overtly a role model i take that responsibility a little bit seriously because i'm like there is a whole generation of young people of color to inspire to who think they could now have a career in something that they might not have thought about previously and maybe yeah. their parents mm-hmm. who are probably our generation could think sure mm. why not Yeah, like when, like when we have kids, yeah. I imagine, you know, like my my mum would be exactly the same. She'd be like, oh, it's not a good career. She'd send me all these articles about struggling comedians, like get a good safe job. Like that's the- And those, things, and those things are real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Those but things are real. But, but what yeah. you've done is go, this is what I really want to do, right? Yeah. And I guess that leads us on to our, our other question actually, is how do you feel now in comparison to when you were working at the home office? Mm. Free, free. Mm. Mm. Um, it's also mega surreal. I was talking a little bit about my background and where I've come from, and the idea that I'm doing this, and because I moved back, because I moved back to Blackburn, and I, I live at home, and I probably spend a, roughly half my time there uh, when I'm not out and about working. It is mad because everyone else is doing normal things mm. and normal jobs, and everyone's great. You know, a lot of entrepreneurs in Blackburn, and um, my, my cousin's a solicitor with his own firm, and, and Alhamdulillah is doing amazingly well. But but I think like 18 months ago, a van, full, a minivan full of my family went down to watch me record Love of the Apollo. Wow. And I'm just thinking that's nuts. Yeah. That is absolutely yeah. nuts. Yeah. It's just, it, is, it, is, it feels very, very surreal. And what's really nice is I constantly get stopped by people telling me how much it means to them mm. the way that I represent community inverted commas. Mm. Because it's always important to me to always be true to myself and, and speak my truth and I have this thing where, 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 where like when I was doing my TV show last year at 10 o'clock and people were pitching sketches to me and stuff oh what about this what about this and I was like okay the one thing I, I, I don't mind pushing the envelope in it and, 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 and saying I mean, you've seen my stuff like and, and saying the absurd stuff to get a big laugh and stuff um, if I believe in it but 
what's really important to me and what we we'll always hang on to is I want to be able to walk the streets of Blackburn mm. without fearing mm. that someone's going to want to punch me in the face. Yeah. Mm. So that's the one line oh, okay. that, that I always have that in the back of my mind. I'm like, okay, what am I saying? What am I doing? And who is that affecting? And what are they going to think of it? Yeah. For anyone who hasn't seen Tez's uh, going against the Australians, if hopefully there's no <laughs> koalas in Blackburn, <laughs> walking around. So I think you're pretty safe. Yeah, yeah. I think I'd be okay. <laughs> Uh, uh, but no, it's like I really liked what you said there. Was like being true to yourself and your mm. values, and like I, like we've known each other loosely through people for for a number of years. And like Tez has always been very like politically charged. Like is would say that much of your, your yes, stand up is it's very around current affairs and the treatment of Muslims and various mm. different people who are underrepresented around the world. And you don't shy away from talking about the things like, and even in times where you could probably look and go, oh, my career could possibly go in a in a faster upward direction if I didn't talk about these things mm. but you've said no this is who I am mm. and this is what I'm going to talk about because mm. this is what's important to the world also because people care now because the world is a lot smaller because of social media and people do care people care what you think and people will ask you mm. Mm. like oh like I was doing a little Q&A thing yesterday uh, on my Instagram and people like three four questions what do you think about what's happening in India mm. I, hadn't, I hadn't properly overtly addressed it before sure. then, and I was like well I'm getting enough questions that I should probably say something okay. and so I said a little something mm. um but I'm smart enough to know, I think because social media started when I was at the home office. Yeah. Mm. So I was always very careful about what I said publicly anyway, because yeah, it could yeah. come back to me at work. I've always been quite good at like, like towing the line when it comes to social media and, and, and public statements and stuff. Mm. Mm. But that doesn't mean they won't come for you. Because <laughs> you know. Like, yeah, because I know. Because uh, I'll give you an example. When I was when I was when I took over Jeremy Corbyn's Instagram mm. uh, back in November ahead of the, ahead of the last election, um, some right wing guy was like, um, "Oh, Corbyn comedian has links to Hamas," and I was like, "What?" I was like, "It's news to me," <laughs> and I was like. Oh, I don't know that this is exciting, <laughs> this is exciting. Yeah. Um, so I clicked on the link and it's, it's this right wing it's like, like an alt-right blog kind of okay. inverted commas news site yeah. and it was literally a tenuous story and it was about so I do a lot of work for a charity called Human Appeal where a charity mm. commission registered charity all above board but back in the day the international arm of that charity which is slightly separate to them they were part of a wide organization who were part of an organization that had links to like, it was that, like, wow. like, like using that logic, you now are also linked to Hamas. Like yes. that's the logic they basically use. Oh, shit. But because they wanted to, <laughs> <laughs> breaking news, um, but because they wanted to like discredit Corbyn, yeah. they used me to try and get to him. Mm. And most people don't read stories, they just read headlines. Yeah, and so I had all, yeah. all this massive backlash and people trying to make it a thing. And for about 24, 48 hours, I was like, I know there's no substance to this story, mm. But it's slightly getting away from me a little bit. Yeah. Mm. Um, to the point where, because I, I do a lot of work for Channel 4, Channel 4 had to do some due diligence. Wow. And they had to get their lawyers on it and stuff. And like within 10 minutes, they were like, there's literally nothing here. Yeah. Because there was nothing there. But for a while online, it was a bit like, rah, 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 people were yeah, jumping in yeah. and stuff. And wow. then a couple of troublemakers with big, big, with big profiles, like hide, like taking that and, and trying to make it into a thing. And, but then they all died down when like people realized that there was just nothing, mm. nothing there, and people people who then read the story were like, "This is really tenuous," and then they kind of it kind of went away a little bit. But then there's about forty eight hours where I was like, "This could really affect my career," mm. but um, oh. but fortunately, it never. And I felt a bit burnt by the experience, and mm. I was like, oh "God, that was like an iota of what Jeremy Corbyn goes through every single day, yeah. every single day." Yeah. Uh, and I remember like people go people through that election campaign were going, "Oh, it says you should run, you should be leader, you should be this, this, that," and I thought. No, I mean not only because it's extremely difficult, which people don't really appreciate, but also <laughs> I mean right in my, the, my my new show that I'm touring in September is going to be about why I shouldn't oh, nice. be in a position of authority or power, <laughs> um, and and if I were to, what would that look like? Um, so yeah, so I'm I'm I'm, I'm having a bit of fun writing that. So this is the populist. Yes, populist. Oh, but, but it was weird because I chose that name just because I I just thought well, someone. I need a title. It's a great name. And then, yeah. and then, and then afterwards, I was talking to a friend about what the show could be about. Yeah. Um, and then we hit upon that, like you know, people during the election going, "Oh, you should do this, you should." Do that. And I was like, <laughs> I, "I mean, I really shouldn't." Um, so yeah, I think I'm going to have a lot of fun writing that. Yeah, as a as a, I mean, we didn't have this question down, but like, how do you deal with that? Like being so public facing and having the persona. 
and you know also being as you said earlier you feel a bit outside of the mm. as a comedian like you're observing you don't always feel part of it, but there must be a spotlight on you constantly like and and how do you deal with that day to day um you know what's interesting i feel like it's corrected a lot of toxic behaviors mm. in yourself yeah okay cuz i will definitely watch how i act now publicly all the time right like especially when talking to like if 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 i'm if i'm talking to a girl like i'm much more measured in what i say sometimes to a detriment where i'm borderline boring online because mm. because i'm like i'm just scared of like something being screenshotted because like you sure. like you might try to be cheeky mm. she might take it the wrong way yeah, yeah, and it's like yeah. oh what what's this guy like and then it's taken out of context they remove some and then and then, and then again these things then then these things run away from you yeah um that's, uh, that's interesting so so yeah and and even when we interact with people like a lot I'm a lot more not always but i try to be a lot more measured and polite mm. and nice you know what's amazing yeah. on twitter the mute button <laughs> the mute button is the best thing twitter has because oh, yeah? you can just mute people who are giving you grief oh, and yeah. you don't need to interact with them so i think i feel like blocking someone gives them a bit of power because mm. they feel like oh, i got to them and yeah. they block me uh, i've won that but if you mute them they don't know you be, they've been muted they just they think you've got they no can, power to ignore them they can just piss in the wind and they get really angry <laughs> yeah. that you're not replying back to them and i don't mind that Okay. And you can also mute conversations and threads. So if someone's tagged you in something and mm. you don't like it, for example, when all this Hamas stuff is going on and people are talking about me, I'll just mute. I can just mute the thread, mm. so people can just carry on talking and I don't see it. And mm. if you don't see it, then it doesn't affect you. Yeah. And I feel like people often just get bogged down into debates and yeah. and, and and hate threads online. It's like you don't need to read that stuff. You don't need to see it. Well, I think that's really. Um, it's 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 not something weird initially thought to say but actually it's quite poignant because in today's society whether you're a celebrity or not like social media and what you put out there even for us yeah. i know we don't we haven't had massive chats about this but given that we're talking about dating anything that we put out as men talking and teaching men and then we know we and we invite women to come and listen yeah. that we have a sense of like you know we we yeah we're not worried but we have a sense that this could easily be misconstrued and we still get people give us stick oh, for, yeah, for yeah, not yeah, being yeah. inclusive enough yeah, yeah, yeah or yeah, saying yeah, something yeah. and yeah. they take a single line and then they go at you about that line and you say oh wait a minute did you listen to the whole episode mm. and they're like oh and then they come back like a day later or they don't come back at all you know and you must experience mm. a lot of people pick all up on time. a small thing all the time and they take a slight misconception to it and they go really far into it and you're like well you've taken this out of context and there's a lot of context before mm. you've not got i think i think what's good with my line of work as well is cuz cuz comedy is a community that will protect itself mm. and so there is a lot of leeway that comedians allow each other yeah to be like well that's comedic license yeah especially if you're on stage i love that actually i, um, I love that you have that freedom like, yeah yeah it's yeah. still it's, i think it's one of the only places now where you can say something and people can just chill out and it's not slander yeah, yeah. Like, with, that, with that australia clip yeah exactly. i was a little bit because like it went well in the room because yeah. i knew i had the audience yeah and so i wanted to pray out But at the same time, I was like, "Yeah, I was things can get ahead of you, and yeah. things can." So I was like, "So I checked with a couple of Australian comics, and they were like, 'This is really funny. Don't worry about it.' <laughs> and you know, it'd be yeah. good publicity if if someone wants to take it the wrong way. It'd be good publicity, but the the comedy community will back you though, mm. and that's what the most important thing. Nice. So our final question is something which I I, I yeah I think you've kind of touched upon it a little bit. Uh, with what you've already said but i think it's really important for a lot of the male listeners especially we 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 know guys who they put like um prestige status like yeah. having money and success and career as being like one of the most uh, and- as in as if it's fundamental to their success in dating and so being someone who's now like massively public facing and a lot of people know you everywhere you go like how is your like how does that impact you in terms of relationships and dating so what what we'll see on that is The people getting laid in comedy, I talk specifically about my industry. The people getting laid in comedy, men getting because I mean, women doesn't really, uh, you know, it's different for them. But the the men getting laid in comedy are probably the men who'd be getting laid outside of comedy. Mm. So if you are in a career that is slightly different to the norm, it's a good icebreaker. But that's it. Mm. Unless you meet someone who really loves your work. And therefore, fancies you, wow. and I always think that's quite. Yeah. I don't think you want to go there too often. Like, like they idolize like groupies. Yeah. yeah, I don't think you want to go there too often. Um, but I don't think because I've always kind of been like a cheeky, charming guy, mm-hmm. and that hasn't really changed in my dating life. Now it just I have a good icebreaker now, 
or people might want to introduce themselves to me rather than the other way around mm. which is That's makes nice. which is a first step is all that, that first yeah. step is always easier in it yeah, yeah. um but you know i i i have comic friends who you know just really you know handsome charming guys who i think would have been who would have been doing very well out of the dating scene if they weren't in comedy and things accelerate for them they might start getting a lot of nudes in their inboxes and stuff and <laughs> in the way that i don't and i'm like oh that would be easier so i'm like i'm not like i'm kind of in that middle phase where i'm like i'm not getting the the nudes in my inbox just going like literally laying it on a plate but it's not exactly a struggle so i'm kind of in that in between where people will introduce themselves and say hi yeah. but i still got to work for it and 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 you know be charming and 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 you know have be a, be a, be a good date okay um because i'm not you know the hunky guy who just would have been doing well at dating mm. like regardless anyway i still would have had to use the same skills if i wasn't doing this job as i would be it's just the introductions are easier Mm. And I imagine also for you, the fact that you are used to talking. enough of the introduction is the hardest thing. Mm. Yeah, sorry, gone. Have you found that to be like the? But yeah, in my, in my dating life, like you no, know, way before I started this, I always found that the the as we call it the cold opening um, or, or, or sliding into a stranger's DMs mm. the hardest thing. Even yeah. now, I don't slide into people's DMs. I can probably think less than a handful of times mm. that I've ever slid into a stranger's. DMs to say hi, like on a, for, for, for a romantic basis. Mm. I just don't do it. I hear so Drake does it quite a lot. <laughs> I'm not surprised. Yeah, that was also it's like a couple of years ago. But it's just like, like hi, I'm Drake. Yeah. <laughs> it was a different power. Mm. Um, um, it's probably his assistant doing it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he hasn't got time for that. His, his body double. <laughs> yeah. um, so I um, yeah, it's fun, but. Um, Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, I'm, I'm still, I'm, I'm quite cautious. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, because yeah. I'm, because I'm, because I, I don't want to be screenshotted, yeah. and because I'm a cheeky guy, and, and in real life, when someone can read body language and tone and stuff, and you can take things a bit further, and the person knows the intent in which it's coming from. Whereas I found online, I found that a bit more difficult mm. because, because people don't, because people don't know you. Yeah. Um. So I've, I've, I've often heard people like, "Oh, you're quite boring in real life," and I'm like. Nice. This isn't real life. Mm. Mm, that's a good one. That's a real good distinction. Um, but also it's like, yeah, I can't be myself in this because I don't know who you are. And often people might introduce themselves and you don't know how old they are. Yeah. You, you don't, you don't right. really know anything about right, them. Right, and from right, a picture, right. pictures can be deceiving because someone might look, oh, they might, 20, they might be 25, they might be 17. You have no idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm always, I'm always a bit cautious. Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not to discourage DMs, <laughs> but, or, or fame. But I'll probably say if you're under 25, yeah. just yeah, just, just DM other people. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's his uh, classified ad going out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> other people. There's a, there's other men to DM. Other if you're, people. If you're other under, men if you're, also exist. If you're, if you're under 25, yeah, yeah I would yeah. say. Wow. Yeah, that's interesting. It's an interesting insight because yeah, like I said, so many so many of us consider that being an alpha or being noticed or being up there mm. like we know of one guy who told us like you know he, he wants to be able to walk into a restaurant and be noticed and and have that and it's like it's you, you, uh, Tez is making a face without a camera but like he's like a confused face and it's like no, because this, I have that now because yeah. I have it like yesterday I was in I was in a restaurant in Birmingham and I literally walked in and there were so many people just looking around and I didn't I didn't like it yeah there you go yeah yeah, yeah. It's interesting. you won't you won't like it when it happens yeah yeah, yeah. it's funny because you don't know where to look <laughs> where did you look okay because normally you want to look around the restaurant and, and just see what who's there and whatever you just want to be you can't do it because everyone's looking at you and yeah. then and then they want you to acknowledge that you've seen them and then and they want, and they want to do the head nod and you kind of have to do it back but, but so, like 40 minutes so, so I time. just kind yeah. of pretend I haven't seen it yeah. and just start talking to my friend wow. wow until someone literally says hey man or whatever that's interesting yeah cool There's so much more we could uh, go into, but uh, I feel hey, we'll do a pot. Yeah, I feel Maybe. our time is our time is limited. Is there mm. anything else, Dave? Because uh... I have to go to a gig. Because <laughs> yeah, I'm gig. always working. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I just I really liked how you said you made clear about the fact that it wasn't necessarily easy. It was a lot of hard work, and mm. and it still continued to be a lot of hard work. Like if you see Tez's Instagram, this guy is like working constantly, putting out great never content stops, constantly. Man like answering questions about everything under the sun on yeah. Instagram. It's not like you're just comedy. It's like, you know, you mm. want to talk about food, animal rights, Tez is there, we'll have a conversation with you, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I think we Desserts. forget this about people <laughs> <laughs> of status, that they're actually complex human beings as mm. well. Um, and status doesn't necessarily bring you everything you want, like, but hard work can. Mm. Yeah, and I think, 
I think if you're an if you're if you're if you're a good, charming, entertaining guy before your status comes along, you'll find that a lot easier to navigate. Whereas if you're relying on status to make you charming and interesting, mm. it's 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 a, it's a, a sandcastle. Wow, mm. that's a soundbite. That's a nice. I think it's a really nice point to end on. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Well, thank you, Tez. Cheers, guys. It's been amazing. It's been funny, and well, thank you for having really me. Man. Insightful. Yeah. Where can uh, where can people find you in the social media world? Uh, Tezilias for all my tour dates, and I'm on a big tour from September mm. onwards. I'm at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. If you're going to be up there, but it will be the same show that I'm doing on tour. So either right. or, uh, and yeah, all my socials are at Tez Ilyas, and I'm sure the spelling is probably on the information about this podcast. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, come find me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Beautiful. Thank you. Thanks. And DMs are open. <laughs> Ladies, you know, Tez is an open man for the DMs. And if so. a guy want to say hi, I will say hi and probably double tap, and that's it. No, no dick pics, though, please. No dick Strictly pics. No, no dick, dick pics. pics. No yeah. dick pics. Cool. Boom. Thank you very much today, Tez. Ciao, ciao. Yeah. Bye.